everyone. This is Matt with Simplistic Reviews with another Simplistic interview. Uh, we are in the midst of uh, Fantasia Fest 2020. I guess we're in day two now at this point, and we're continuing on our, our interview series with some very interesting individuals and uh, people that are uh, putting the films out for Fantasia. Um, today's episode, I have a friend all the way from the West Coast, but of course we're doing the Zoom style and everything like that, so we're being extremely social distancing at this point so but i got ryan spindell today he is the director of the film the mortuary collection um how you doing today ryan i am doing great i'm just realizing that i'm still wearing my bandana as if it was a style choice i wasn't going to say uh, anything to you but i mean <laughs> i thought it was maybe because you know when people walk by you're putting up up, up above <laughs> or something or, or you're just you're planning a you know, you, you and the boys are planning a heist later on. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe a little both. Who knows? I'm not going to judge knows? you on on your on your <laughs> fashion decisions or your <laughs> criminal conspiracies. You know, that's not for me to judge or anything. <laughs> great, great. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. So yeah. So, um, Brian, tell, tell. I mean, let's just kick it off this way. Tell tell the audience who Ryan Spindell. You're actually my second interview in a, in a row interviewing a Ryan. So. Uh, it yeah. also interviewed uh, Ryan, who uh, directed uh, Fried Berry, that's also been featured uh, at Fantasia Fest. So, mm -hmm. what, what stands you out, Ryan, from all the other Ryans out in the world? What, what's your story? Well, I mean, I, I, not very much. We have a, uh, a meeting twice a week. It's the Ryan's meeting, where we all get together <laughs> and commiserate over the fact uh, that we're all basically the same person. Um, so, yeah, I'm just another Ryan. I've got a beard. Did the other Ryan have a beard? Um, Kind of, yeah. It, it wasn't as glorious yeah. as yours. Your, yours is okay. a lot fuller. Uh, <laughs> okay. If you, saw, if you saw mine, maybe like a few days ago before I, I decided <laughs> to take it off, we we could have been maybe rivaling each other. But you you have you have the high crowd right now. Okay. Cool. Crowd. Well, I, I'm I, I'm just like the other Ryan, but with a bigger beard. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, um, I checked out a uh, mortuary collection. Uh, it's something that you've been kind of shopping around already because I know it, it came out, uh, what was it, like mid-2019 or late-2019? Because I know it's been at a few of the other festivals and now it's landed, you know, north of the border up in Canada and everything. And uh, um, reading some publicity about it, I mean, it had a, had a great following. People were super stoked about it. I know I was because I just, I absolutely adore just anthology horror films. I think they're the most fun. They're the most bang for your buck. You know, if there's one story you don't like, there's a chance you're going to like the other stories. And with a good wraparound, it, it just works in so many levels. So it brought me to those Tales of the Crypt days, those Tales from the Dark Side days. Um, every Everything about it just kind of got me back into my childhood of, of watching Creep Show and stuff like that as well. And uh, um, just, what, 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 what was, well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 sorry, I'm like gushing. I'm, I'm, I'm like, crushing <laughs> no, no, right no, now. please. Yeah, I know it's like, don't worry. I'll take, I'll take care of this interview right now. I'll just talk, <laughs> I'll just talk for you. <laughs> but, um, what was the, uh, what was the road to, uh, kind of making mortuary collection and what was, you know, what's your, I mean, obviously you're a horror fan. So what, what was your Genesis? What was your, your kind of, um, your birth of loving the genre and kind of coming to this point where you're coming with a full length film, like, like, uh, the mortuary collection. Oh man, that's a long story. Um, I, I know that's, that's I mean, a loaded question. No, I mean, it's, a, this movie in particular was, uh, was, it's almost ridiculous. I, it, it's almost such a long process of getting it made that I, when we first finished it, we were sort of debating, like, do we, even get into like what it took to, to sort of put this movie together over the past eight years <laughs> or do we just like pretend we just sort of we just did it like on a whim uh and i think we came to the decision that it's better to sort of talk about it because again this is sort of like what we were talking about when we first sort of got on the call is that mm -hmm. uh you know it's easy a lot of filmmakers filter themselves because you have to be careful uh, when you're talking about your movies but the, mm -hmm. the fact is is that making movies is incredibly hard and I think for other filmmakers out there, it's it's helpful to see that we're not alone. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but I, before we get into it, I, I'll answer that question. But I actually had a quick follow up question for what Ooh, you were saying. For me, yeah. um, you, we were talking about. I, I'm obviously a huge fan of anthologies. Mm -hmm. I, I love them with all of my heart, uh, and uh, I agree that I my whole thing with anthologies growing up was always if there's one segment uh, that kills 
then I'll, I'll, I'll remember that anthology as being something awesome. Like I remember always loving Creepshow too, even mm-hmm. though because of the raft. The raft, um, yes. Okay, and that's the one. I mean, you had one. You had a one of three chance of picking the right one. So you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. It's because Chief Woodenhead is the best segment anyone's ever seen. <laughs> the best <laughs> anthology segment ever. <laughs> but it's interesting because I, I watch, I, I still watch. You know, I watch Creepshow one and two, at least a couple times a year. Mm-hmm. And um, Creepshow two is has got some pretty weak segments in it, uh, other than the raft. But in my mind it's an awesome movie because I love that short so much. Mm -hmm. Um, But on the flip side, some people seem to go the other way. Some people seem to think uh, if there's a segment that like, uh, I think Guillermo del Toro said uh, anthologies are only as good as their worst segment. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And so I'm just wondering where you land. Cause I land on, I'm the optimist. I'm like, I I need one good thing and it's a movie I love. Um, Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? I mean, it, it's tough. It, like within an anthology, I mean, I'm always going to be committed to it just because I like the subgenre that I'm going to get multiple stories and usually a really interesting wraparound story that kind of brings everything together at the mm-hmm. end. And I guess in the case with Creepshow 1 and Creepshow 2, if you're just going to keep using that as an example, um, from top to bottom, and there's, you know, the weakest one, I mean, and people might hate me for in Creepshow 1, the, the, um, uh, the Ted Dancer one, the, the, the tie, the uh, what's tied you over? Yeah, what, what, the something tied to tide you over. I mean, yeah. everybody thinks that's the weakest one, and in so many, so many ways, it is because it also is like the, the, the short right before the crate, the crate, which is my absolute favorites. Uh-huh. Everything from the music to the, to, yeah. to Fluffy to how Hallbrook and we've all been there before. We just want to kill our wives or yeah. our girlfriends. Well, like, how well. can we do this? Like, <laughs> good thing I found an animal, uh, a, 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 <laughs> almost a prehistoric animal underneath uh, my uh, um, in a crate underneath the uh, college at Horlicks College. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but even with that being said, I mean, it, it, it's it's so difficult to take one thing and say screw it i mean I, I'm, I'm out because one thing is bad mm-hmm. there's even there and even with all the stories that are kind of weak there's always mm-hmm. like one part that you know even something to tide you over leslie nielsen is great i think he's hilarious awesome. yeah and he's yeah, fantastic yeah, yeah. and if i if in if i could take one thing away from it it's like perfect that's the one right there um yeah and then even in creep show too you know it's only three stories and i i think my disappointment in that was that it went from like five stories to three stories i'm like I'm, I feel like I'm getting gypped here. Like, come on, you're not being it's fair. True. Where are the other two stories in here? I wanted five, not 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 three. Um, it's true. But, but then you know, Tales from the Dark Side. That that's a three. That's a three part story too. That has a really fun wraparound. Mm-hmm. So um, it it's hard. To, it's hard to really make a bad anthology unless you just have stories that just are not not compelling. Or just they're too short. Or the, I mean, even bad acting can have some good parts. You know, I, I look at Creep Show three, and people are like, "There's a Creep Show three. It's like, yes, there is. Yeah, it's not very good. Yes. It's no. uh, kind of a mess. Uh, yeah. It's kind of the thing yeah. that would maybe if you watch Creep Show three first, like, why do people like anthologies? These things suck. It's like, <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. And I, I, I mean, I've, I, I studied a lot of them. I mean, most of them uh, in the early days of sort of putting this movie together. And um, like the thing about Creepshow, which is you know one of my favorite movies of all times, Creepshow One, um, mm-hmm. is that I I can't even watch that movie without uh, without the nos- lens of nostalgia. So mm-hmm. I, I can't I can't really see that movie um, critically anymore yeah. because of like what it means to me as a person. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I will say that like just the pinging off of what you're saying about um, to tide you over. Um, I think my biggest gripe, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna pick apart the sort of the the Godfather of all anthologies, let's, say, yeah, let's, that, pick, let's pick this apart. And make this really let's, do, let's, let's just make this all about like how Creep <laughs> Show uh, is a weak movie. No, not at all. Um, but my my biggest gripe would be how uh, th- this the Father's Day story mm. and uh, to tie you over are kind of the same story. Yeah, zombie um, stories. Yeah, yeah. It's two two sort of yeah zombie revenge. Zombie stories. revenge. Yeah different different sort of uh you know decorations on the cake mm-hmm. pun intended but yeah. um <laughs> nice one. but but ult- but ultimately kind of kind of the same sort of the, the same sort of twist uh, reveal at the end so i remember when we were putting this together that was another thing it was like okay each story has to be a completely different subgenre and we can't mm-hmm. sort of tell the same story twice yeah. um 
and it was kind of there was a lot like sort of good kind of coming back around to the mortuary collection there was a lot of work put into sort of thinking about the things um that i love the most about anthologies and thinking about things that sort of always bugged me or, or always were sort of underwhelming and really trying to go after that um so the first thing was the wraparound what you're mm -hmm. talking about i i i love a year i agree the tales from the dark side is one of my favorite wraparounds yeah. especially for an american film mm -hmm. uh and then I'm, I'm a, I, I did, I watched a lot of the amicus films uh, from the seventies, which also oftentimes had one director and, and sort of, they also put a ton of work into what the sort of framing device was. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I remember Asylum. Have you seen Asylum? Yeah. It's been a, it's been, it's been a while, but it's been uh, a minute. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I just love that. I, I, to me, the wraparound doesn't have to be the most robust, interesting, complicated, twisty story. Uh, in the bunch, but I want something. I want something to grab onto. I want something that sort of carries me through. Mm -hmm. um, and so we kind of started the mortuary collection with that in mind. Like, what, what's the what's the framing device that that if you took the shorts out would still be a story in its own? Uh, and then sort of really put a lot of energy into sort of making that what the thematics of the whole film are, and then sort of letting the segments almost be the one-offs as opposed to sort of the framing device being the just a bookend system if yeah that makes sense because the well the, the biggest the thing that reminded me of it too like just clancy brown's demeanor and everything and i want to talk about clancy brown in a minute too um uh, sure. he, he's fantastic because you can't see enough, enough about him uh, but he reminded me very much of uh, clarence williams the third in uh tales from, tales from the hood i don't know mm -hmm. if that was something mm -hmm. that you thought about when you were like mm -hmm. let's create a creepy mortuary mortuary guy I, very much got yeah. the pseudo swag he's got like the pseudo swagger clarence williams the third with the macabre creepiness of like i'm the crypt keeper type thing like yeah and, and yeah. not not new crypt keeper but crypt keeper from the 70s like from from the old tales from the crypt <laughs> movie and things like that um and no, even, absolutely uh, you know things with like even trilogy of terror kind of like it was especially the last story or uh, like the end of the wraparound reminded me of something from trilogy of terror too so mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. there was just so so much stuff that i mean you you obviously are a student and a you know a, a lover of just that sh the subgenre, and it feels like you just crammed everything in there but made it work so well uh, well so. i think that's a and i think that's a common thing for uh, you know, first time filmmakers, you've been waiting your whole life to make a feature. And the inclination is, is to sort of kitchen sink it. Mm -hmm. Just kind of, this might be the last one I ever get to do. <laughs> Let's do everything I love. And I sort of was lucky slash unlucky in that I chose an anthology movie, which really gave me the ability to kind of go anywhere to do monsters, to do a slasher movie, mm -hmm. to do sort of like an Edgar Allan Poe-esque movie, and yeah. to really kind of cram, you know, three dozen different sort of strong inspirations into one story and, and hopefully make it feel like uh, sort of all part of, of, of one larger whole. Were any of those stories kind of like based on fears that you had as a kid watching these movies or anything like that? Like is, is anything from this like from a subconscious thing like oh I want to make a film I want to make a short about this because this scared the shit out of me as a kid or something that you just wanted to be more because I mean, your, your stories do range from ver like very just kind of simple, like from the first story that's literally about five minutes long, mm -hmm. to you know the second story, which definitely tells a big it's it's a lot of social commentary regarding that. Mm -hmm. and, like you know, you're you're from your Edgar Allan Poe uh, uh, kind of feature, and then into mm -hmm. your slasher into your slasher feature. Um, was there anything kind of like purposeful to make making those four films like? What were you trying to say maybe about all, all, all four of the shorts? Well, it's interesting. I think I, I think it started off um, from a pure fun factor perspective. It mm -hmm. started off with what do I love about Creepshow the most? What do mm -hmm. I love about Tales from the Dark Side? I love that they're fun. I love that they're cheeky. Mm -hmm. I love that they're sort of unexpected and wild. And so I the first pass of the script was that. It was like, let's just make a movie that's fun. I don't, I'm not putting nothing else into it. Just, yeah. I don't even care that much about characters. I'm, each character will be an archetype of a character from something else I love. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was sort of the, the beginning. But then once we sort of had that script in place, I was like, well, if I'm watching all of these anthology movies and I'm sort of like picking apart what I like and what I don't like, I don't want to make an homage movie. I want to mm -hmm. make a movie that sort of is a love letter too, but is of its own sort of, uh, sort of 
its own creation. It's, it's something, something that like sort of stands apart. Uh, and then I started really thinking about the characters and I started trying to understand like what, um, what is it that would drive these characters uh, to make these sort of over the top decisions mm -hmm. and how can I sort of infuse these stories with um, some real ideas and, and real sort of elements that mean something to me without being preachy about it yeah. and also without losing the fun factor. And that's where the balance kind of comes in that gets tricky because the more you develop a character like um, in the second story, the sort of the womanizing frat guy, yeah. um, <laughs> I, I was sort of adamant that I, I, I want this guy to uh, to have sort of some human aspects to him. And then I was sort of getting some blowback by some people who were saying like, look, this is an anthology, these are morality stories. People want to just see someone who sucks get their comeuppance. Of, of and I was classic. like, <laughs> classic, right? And I was like, well, yeah, but I've seen that a million times before. Like, how can we, how can we sort of give him some sort of depth and make him someone who's an interesting character um, and still have the sort of same result? And then I, I, when I, once I did that, I actually got blowback from people. They're like, well, now you're empathizing with this really shitty character. And I was like, <laughs> have you seen the end of the movie? Like, I'm not empathizing with this character. Like he gets exactly what I think is coming to him. If not, worse, I just kind yeah. of yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to sort of try to layer something else in, in into the character along the way, so it's not it's not black and white. And I think that's what's interestingly the the kind of this actually is coming back to your initial question about mm -hmm. sort of how this all came to be. But um, this movie sort of is this. There's these dueling personalities in the movie. Uh, there's Montgomery, who's this sort of the mortician who runs mm -hmm. this uh, this place, and he has this sort of antiquated idea about what story should be, mm -hmm. and what sort of and, and 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 Sam is sort of the opposite. Sam is yeah. kind of the this new plucky kind of like ah, I don't like your stories; they're old fashioned. I want something unexpected. I want to yeah. merge genres, and so the two of them are sort of battling. And in a way, I think that's sort of maybe two sides of my own taste as a director. This is all stuff I've been figuring out literally in the past couple of weeks, mm -hmm. but it's sort of my, my love of the classics and the sort of the archetypes and the sort of these morality stories that stand the test of time. And then this urge as sort of a younger filmmaker to be like, but I want to change it. I want to twist mm -hmm. it. I want to surprise people. I want to do this. And it's kind of this budding of the heads of the two um, that kind of creates what I think is this sort of uh, morally ambiguous interesting thread that kind of weaves yeah. all the way to the very end and whether or not people are going to pick up on that kind of stuff um, with an anthology movie on their first viewing I don't know um, but it's definitely there for anyone who wants to sort of look a little bit deeper yeah because I mean you think about just classic anthologies I mean none of them are very transgressive in terms of like you know maybe the violence could be excessive you're like oh my god you know this guy got his head ripped off or this right. you know, this person got their heart ripped out or something it's like okay well that can happen in any horror film all the time but when when to your point with i guess montgomery and sam having a you know a butting of the heads of well, this is the old fashioned way that we used to do things back in the eighties. It's like, well, I don't want this anymore because this is a new age and we're bored with your old shitty right. telling me like what's right, what's wrong. The bad guy always gets it. The good guy always wins type of thing like that. And just kind of mixing that up and kind of stirring it in a pot and making it a little bit different and crazy, right. and, you know, and, and to, to reinvent, you know, a subgenre that's tried and true and everybody just kind of does it the same way all the time, you know, but you're also, you know, interested in like the world building aspect of it as well too, which you don't really see with a lot of, I mean, it may be creep show because everything kind of takes place like in Maine or like the Northeast or something like that. So you have a common thread of the, the Northeast you know, spooky mm -hmm. Stephen King type uh, element, but you, you created this whole, very kind of, I mean, for lack of a better term, like, you know, Lovecraftian elements to the whole thing as well, too, and especially with the first monster. That's clearly something that, mm -hmm. you know, he, he would have, he, that um, Lovecraft would have come up with. But I like you blending everything in that could be all happening within the same time. And it is in a lot of ways. I mean, everything kind of works from the, from the first opening scene of the paper boy delivering papers, seeing all the news stories and everything like that on the paper. Um, that's what kind of, it tracked to me right away because there was something kind of more interesting going on than just like, here's a bunch of stories, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to throw some shit at the wall and see if it sticks. Mm -hmm. um, everything mm -hmm. worked so fluidly and kept you vested, in, interest, very vested in the, in the story 
And then at mm-hmm. the end, you're like, oh, wow, okay, I remember that from the beginning. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I think just weaving your story and weaving your world and leaving it open to do more of this if you really wanted to. <laughs> at the end of the day, I'm sure this was an exhausting process. Uh, you mentioned eight years in the making. I'm sure you're like, uh-huh. shit, I never want to take a movie to be eight years <laughs> anymore at this point. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I, I, that's what it's all about. It's, it is the world building, and um, that's the kind of stuff. Uh, that I love uh, in all of my projects, honestly. And I mean, there are there are world building threads in this movie that connect to everything I've I've ever made. Honestly, mm-hmm. the, even even the brand, the brand of the products in the movie is actually this uh, uh, Finkelman's, oh, which is yes. a this is actually this hat is a prop from another project that I did for uh, Sam Raimi. Um, this this show called Fifty States of Fright, mm-hmm. um, in which I'm even taking my weird eccentric world building and like cramming it into other projects that I'm working on that aren't even under the umbrella. So I I just love that kind of thing. I mean, I think filmmakers like Edgar Wright, who infuse so much detail into their movies, I think Mm -hmm. the movies that you can watch again, Peter Jackson does this too. Yeah. Um, the, The movies that you can watch again and again are the ones that I'm the biggest fan of because I just feel like there's so much more going on. There's the one off, there's a lot of like, especially like ghost movies tend to be scary one time and then you're yeah. kind of done with them. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I'm interested in sort of this pastiche that gets richer as you watch it more. Uh, and I don't know why it's, it's, it's just a, it's just a straight nerdy, like it's what I love to see. So it's what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a lot of fun and it's, it's sort of uh, this movie in particular, I think there's, there's something almost in every single frame uh, and if there isn't something in the frame, it's only because budgetarily we were unable to do something we had planned. Yeah. Well, it's even better if it's something you've already created. It's like you have complete control. Like even in the last story, you include the the babysitter murders in there as well, mm-hmm. too. It's like, oh, well, something have you already done. It's like, well, easy. Throw it in there. It's something right. that the universe have already created. And I'm not having to pay for residuals or, you know, copyright right. or something like that. It's like, I did that. God damn it. I already did that. Right. And there, uh, the 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 mental hospital uh, in the babysitter murders, Kirksdale. Mm-hmm. Um, Kirksdale is the name of the mental hospital in my short film, Kirksdale, that I made way back in 2007 Ooh. in film school. And there's threads that even connect to that. Like it, it, it goes deep. It goes deep, man. I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to get into it. I too mean, much. I, I, <laughs> hey, I mean, I don't, I don't want to stress you out about going too deep. Or <laughs> I mean, you're talking about mental hospitals. We're gonna have to sit on the couch and have to exactly. talk to me about these deep-seated, you know, what what's really going on uh, in that in years or something like that. <laughs> now, um, we we alluded to this earlier, and it's kind of switching gears a little bit. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Clancy Brown, of course, because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you know he's he's your. I would call him the star, star of the, or star of the film. Um, uh-huh. Yes. You know, by, by by all means, and also he was an EP of, uh, for, in the film as well too. Um, now, was this something you kind of pitched to him, saying, "Hey, I really want you in this film. I respect your respect, respect your work from Starship Troopers to Shawshank yep. to being yep. the voice of Lex Luthor and doing everything else you've done in your illustrious career." Um, yeah, <laughs> and it's it's great to see that he still likes to do these genre films because I guess it's something that he's you know he's always done in his life, and mm-hmm. I think he's great as just like this tall man esque Clarence Williams Crypt Keeper kind of guy going on a little bit, and um, just what was it kind of like getting him on board? Was that a chore? Or was that like it, here's the pitch? It was. I jump in. It, it, it wasn't, it wasn't. Uh, I mean, this kind of goes back to the genesis of it, but I, I wrote the, the whole feature in 2012. And when I realized that an anthology movie is very hard to get set up, I decided to take one short out and make it. And mm-hmm. so The Babysitter Murders, the, the, the final story, that was the, sh- the most contained short in the project. So we did a Kickstarter and we financed that and we made that short. And mm-hmm. uh, the short did really well and did the festival circuit. Um, and so what ended up happening was, uh, you know, n- no studios were interested in anthology because they're still very difficult to sort of get finance in the traditional way. Mm-hmm. But we did find independent financing. Um, and, you know, there was there was a minute where I was like, oh, I spent all this time making this short and nothing's coming of it. <laughs> but then I realized that once we were actually making the movie, 
with someone like Clancy Brown, I could send him the short. I didn't have to send him the script with like a pitch and like get in there and song and dance him because I could sort yeah. of send him this piece of material and say, this is not, this isn't like what the movie's going to be like. This mm -hmm. is actually a part of the movie. Yeah. We're going to put this is this like proof of concept before. basically, or part of the proof of concept at least. Yeah. So, so I, I, that helped us sort of bypass a lot of the sort of gatekeepers and kind of get right to some of these amazing people. And of course with Clancy, I still had to go to a diner up in North Hollywood and like sit down with him and basically prove to him that I was like able to handle this thing. And he's a giant person with like yeah. huge hands and this voice all the time. And he's like so cool and like so like calculated with everything he says that it's intimidating as hell. But within a few minutes of us sitting there, we started talking about science fiction and I was like, oh, he's also like a huge nerd. Perfect. Thank God. I, yeah, <laughs> and he, and, and like we got along like gangbusters and you know, we went up to Astoria, Oregon to shoot with him. And this is a guy that, that's worked with the best directors in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's an intimidating thing to sort of go and in, go into set and have your first actor be this person that's worked with everyone. Uh, and I, I never once felt any sort of, uh, I never once felt any sort of um, bravado or, yeah. or, or or feeling of superiority. He was the coolest guy on set. A couple of fans came in to set who were big uh, um, Highlander fans. And he was like, come on in, let's take a tour of the set. Like he was, ju he's just the coolest guy in the world. And it's like, it's one of those things you hear about that you don't ever expect you're going to get. Uh, and it, it made making the movie for me just personally uh, such a great experience. What was he like? What was he like on the set? Was he just like very? Was he commanding, or was he like very easygoing, or was he just kind of like was he joking, or was he like uh, in in between takes? You no, know, was he kind of like a perfectionist? Uh no, he's real loose. He's real cool. He's a real, <laughs> he he's a like real he cool is, dude. He would be though. So <laughs> he is. He's 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 intimidating aesthetically, but he's so cool and just chill all the time. That like honestly, even if he was upset with me ever, I don't know. if he would have showed it um but no I, he would tell jokes but jokes in his very like they kind of the kind of jokes that sneak up on you where you're like wait is he kidding oh no he's kidding okay that's a good very, one very droll um, <laughs> but he also he was working with caitlin uh who plays sam mm -hmm. and she is uh she's not a new actor but she's you know she hasn't done a whole lot and he quickly sort of created this rapport with her and, and sort of they really enjoy working together and he kind of took her under his wing and i think the two of them um, it, just, just like in the movie where they're playing these two, these two different sort of character types, they're in real life they kind of represent this. She is young, she is new, he's been around, and watching them, their styles butt heads while their characters are butting heads was actually like one of the most amazing things. My, my only regret would be that it was such a small budget film that we didn't have time to really explore sort of where those characters could go because every every shot was so specifically like we need this and then this and then this mm -hmm. go we need this and then this and then this go. Um, but I think that within that tight structure, we were able to sort of, they were able to bring the characters to life and we were able to use sort of the sets and the design and sort of the world of the movie to kind of uh, get a lot of that across. Yeah, because I know uh, you work with Caitlin on uh, Babysitter Murders as well too. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, she does have that like plucky, I can see her, you know, as just like, like a Jamie Lee Curtis type character and stuff like that. Totally. I think, you know, she has that kind of, Un un understated badassness but won't take shit from anybody you know and she I, does. I, and i can see that you know especially in in the in the wraparound when they're going back and forth you know they're kind of butting heads and i i wonder if uh, what was all that scripted or were, were, did you allow them some freedom to kind of like go with the flow a little bit on what they were saying back and forth or was it kind of like a little bit of both i guess um, it was pretty scripted. I think what I like to do is I, uh, if I have time, I had a little bit of time on this one, like mm -hmm. six hours or something. Um, but what I really love to do is I, I sort of bring the actors together and run the scene. And then I just sort of let them riff. Mm -hmm. And we kind of see if we can find some gold in there. So something that like, you're sitting in a room, you're sitting at a coffee shop, you're writing a screenplay. Um, it's very easy to sort of fall into sort of these single small ideas. And I like to get my actors together and sort of let them sort of say sky's the limit. And then um, when that happens, you inevitably find these great little nuggets that you can sort of build on. And so then once we sort of do that for a few hours, I'll actually go back and I'll rewrite the script 
based on those conversations. So there's like, there's a little bit of their life in this, in the script, mm -hmm. but again, it was like, it was such an intense schedule with this one that we didn't have a whole lot of time to improv. And, it, and it's, it's a, it's a regret that I sort of have um, something that couldn't be avoided, but it's something that I'd love to do in the future is, is just have the time to play a little bit more because I do think that there's so much magic that comes out of that. No, I mean, it, 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 if it's organic, because it, it just seemed organic. It seemed like, you know, they were witty back and forth and some of the faces he makes when she says what she says, it's, it's not like his complete disdain. I, mean, I know that's part of his character, but he's also like, this, yeah, this fucking kid, I can't even yeah. say right now. <laughs> and the interesting so, thing is both of them, I, like, I, I'm with both of them. Like, I, I'm when, when Montgomery's like, talking about how the, the classics are the best or the classics for a reason. Like I mm -hmm. agree with that. I love the archetypes. I love the, the old format, but I agree with her when she's like, but it's kind of old. And I think like, like, so one interesting thing is you were talking about sort of the world building the newspapers um, at the beginning of the movie, originally the, the medicine cabinet story mm -hmm. was not in the script. It, that okay. was actually um, the first story was a fully robust, like 20 page story. Okay. Uh, and then as we were getting into the making of it, we quickly realized um, there's no way we can afford to make another story. We're, like not only financially like to, to shoot it, but also mm -hmm. just runtime wise, because the movie is already clocking in like almost two hours. Yeah. And so we had to lose that story. And so I actually put clues, little bits about that story in the wraparound. So as if that story is still happening mm -hmm. uh, in the background of the town, but we haven't seen it. Um, but then we got to this point where the producers were like, well, we need a story here. You have to write something very short. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And I, I was like, I really want to do a monster. I need a monster. There's no monster in here somehow. Let's do a monster movie. So I wrote this monster movie and I finished it. And I looked at it and I was like, this isn't a substantial story. This story is not satisfying to me. <laughs> and so then I was like, but actually it does set the tone really well. It and does it kind of really sets up what our overarching premise is, which is like this debate about what makes a story. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just took literally my own inner issues with the short and just crammed them right into the movie. Like uh, make and it work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and I, like now I'm, I'm really happy about it because I didn't think about it till afterwards, but most anthologies, the shorts are the same length. So it was kind of mm -hmm. interesting to shake up the, the run times and kind of throw people off a little bit that that threw me off in the beginning too because i mean the beginning with the start of the wraparound and then you have this one story and i'm like damn that, that was really short and it cuts right back to the wraparound I'm like is this gonna be multiple very bunch of shorts yeah short, like short shorts or is yeah. this gonna is is what is the setting up but i think looking back in hindsight now it's one of these things where he's you know he Here's your classic story. The bad person gets their comeuppance. And she's like, this is bullshit. Right. What are you, right. stupid ass right. story? Give me something better than this crap. And this is horrible. Right. right. <laughs> so right. it was Absolutely. this funny self-deprecating way you kind of worked that into it, but also weaved it into the overall narrative of what you're, what, what the, the two main characters are really trying to get across throughout the entire film. Um, real quick. Um, just want to talk about the gore effects because I think they're really all, especially in the second story. I mean, it went places in the second story. I didn't really expect it to go. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, and I do appreciate the fact that I believe, what, what do we say about 90, 95% is probably practical with, with, with throughout the entire film, I would say. I mean, I guess maybe, maybe oh, yeah. the monster and stuff like that, but that the, the, the second story and then the big, you know, the big, uh, splooge if you want to say almost in uh -huh. a lot of ways at the very end um but then also has a very interesting reveal so who who are you working with on the gore effects and just kind of like were, were all these coming from your idea like i want this to happen to um the the, the, the character because who who is it in, in uh, the second story it's jacob Evaldi. jacob elordi elordi yeah because i know oh, him yeah. from uh, i know him from euphoria on hbo uh -huh. So I saw uh -huh. him on Euphoria, and it's funny because he's almost kind of sort of playing the same character a little bit I, I, in this I, I in Euphoria a little bit. I'm like, I know. hold he, on, same he guy. Did, same he did person. this one first, and then I saw that, and I was like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, this is like art imitating art. This is like too much like him. I don't want him to be <laughs> pigeonholed as like the sadistic frat guy type. It, exactly. I think at one point in time, uh, somebody was saying like, 
like, oh, Jacob's really, really blowing up because um, he's like, a, he's a heartthrob type character. Yeah. And, and they're like, it's going to be great for the movie. I'm like, well, I don't know if his fans are going to be super keen on like where, where the movie goes. Um, but yes, the I thought it was perfect, were. actually. He's like, yes, because <laughs> compared yeah. to what I see him in Euphoria, I'm like, yes, this is what I want. <laughs> <laughs> um the practical effects were 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 huge and uh the the very right off the top the very first thing we talked about was that we wanted to go all practical effects and mm. to be honest the only places in the whole movie where we had to go digital was only because we had some sort of catastrophe and we were forced into doing it because it was mm. planned every single thing was planned to be sort of real sets real creatures real everything um and so and we ended up what we did and this comes back again to having the short and to be able to use like a piece of the film to send out mm -hmm. is um, I sat down there and I was, I was worried about who was going to do it. Cause you know, we were talking to some really, really great sort of independent, like up and coming artists and stuff. And I was like, Oh, it's such a big load. And I was like, mm -hmm. I'm just going to do something. I'm going to send an impassioned email to three of my favorite production, like uh, special effects companies in the world. I'm just going to go like, I'm going to go mm -hmm. ham. I'm going to like yeah. write this like big impact. Like, this is why I love you. Like, this is the project. We don't have much money. Uh, and two of the three of them got back to me. Um, and uh, one of them was Spectral Motion, which um, they couldn't do it schedule wise, but they mm -hmm. loved it. They, they were very sort of uh, complimentary and they sort of pushed me in the right direction. But the other one was K and BFX, mm -hmm. um, who, who, who are known for Starship Troopers and Tremors and, uh, the alien versus predator and all of these like insane like death becomes her yeah. like movies that i've just been like obsessed with my whole life um and they watched the short and they they loved it and they read the script and they loved it and they sat down they're like how much money do we have and i told them and they were like we don't love that <laughs> but we'll do it and it, they sort of they, they got right in the trenches with us and it even got to the point where um Alec Gillis, who's the, the guy who owns the company, I mean, mm -hmm. he's he's a legend and he's been um he's he he just runs the place now. He's not like necessarily a guy who gets in the trenches, but mm -hmm. he was on set puppeting tentacles like a wild man <laughs> on this movie that we made for no money. And I was just like standing here watching Alec Gillis and this amazing crew of people like create like a practical in the room tentacle monster. And it was just like a humbling experience. Uh, and it was, I, I can't thank those guys enough. I like, I, I hope I make movies with them forever because it was, it was just so cool. I mean, I, I, I mean, to, to get, to get a get like that, but I mean, also to your, uh, to your point of just saying, look, I'm just going to put it out here. Everything's on the line, putting my balls <laughs> on the line and we're going to see what happens and to get <laughs> them to be, to do your effect for, you know, for you know, on, a, on, a, on an extreme budget is, and then have the, the man himself saying, well, screw it. I'll just get in the trenches. I'll, I'll, I'll move these tentacles around and stuff like that. I mean, wild. It, and, it, and, and, and I mean that, and that is the independent process. The independent process is like, you're just hurtling forward like a bullet and, and all the things that you think you're, you're, you're too proud to do. Mm -hmm. You'll do eventually because you, you don't have a choice. You're, you're, yeah. you're, you're on the path. And you know, for every one of those impassioned emails, or reach outs in which I found somebody who's way out of my league to work on the movie. You know, there's 200 people that rejected straight out, didn't reply, uh, cold shouldered. And that's yeah. like, that sort of comes with the territory. And, uh, and, and the, the bigger you want to go mm -hmm. on no budget, the harder, the harder you're setting yourself up uh, yeah. to sort of follow through. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you, you finish, you collapse, you sleep for two years, <laughs> and, and then you sort of finally get to watch the movie with an audience for a virtual audience, a virtual sometimes, audience sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you, uh, and you, you kind of re realize um, why you do it. And that's sort of, uh, I think that's what it's all about. Well, that's interesting. They kind of bring me to like the next, like kind of the last little section that, that I want to wrap up on is uh, virtual screenings, virtual festivals, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously movie theaters, independent theaters aren't open and we don't really know when they're going to be reopening, when it's safe and everything mm -hmm. like that too. What what's the kind of has it has it been disheartening to you to not be able to completely see this with packed audiences or maybe even before everything kind of went to shit you know the world went to shit you know you got to see it maybe with a few screenings with some people mm -hmm. and then what what do you like what do you kind of see the future I mean obviously hopefully this won't <laughs> last forever or anything like that we can yeah. get 
back to back to work we we all want to do that but um i mean what's been the kind of i don't say fanfare but what's been kind of like the response to the film now that you haven't been able to really screen it the way you want to have it screened basically yeah i mean it's a, it's incredibly disheartening. Mm-hmm. Um, the, I think first and foremost, because when you make a movie on this scale at this budget range, you kind of go in knowing you're not going to make any money off of it. And yeah. as a matter of fact, you're probably going to be in debt for several years. But the, the big reward at the end is that if you make something that you're proud of and you can sort of get into these festivals, you can travel with the film, you can uh, you, you can you know travel internationally sometimes you meet other filmmakers mm-hmm. uh, you have drinks you talk you commiserate and you sort of grow as a sort of uh, as, as a person within this world of, of your peers um, to get to the point where you're you know you're actually you know working in the big leagues uh, and I think what happened with the, the pandemic that was such a bummer is it sort of wiped out the festivals so it was like the one reward that you kind of get at the end of the at the end of the trail of tears <laughs> is um is nothing it, it, it's sort of waiting around so we luckily got to screen um at fantastic fest mm-hmm. uh and we got to screen at toronto after dark uh and a couple of more uh, international festivals right before the pandemic happened but we had probably 30 or close to 40 festivals lined up that we were going to sort of travel around the world and sort of finally sort of celebrate this thing that we've been working on for eight years uh and one by one they all fell away and i was you know Part of it's like it's easy to be self-pitying, but then I have friends who had movies that were premiering at South by Southwest, and they were premiering at mm. um, at uh, Tribeca, and they mm. didn't even get to premiere their movies. So yeah. um, I, I'm lucky that I come in, it came out right before, but I, I my heart goes out to all these people because it's for for all of us, it's not just a, a movie that we're just premiering that we made on on a whim. Some people spent their whole lives trying to make these things, and it's it's tough. It's tough, and I, I I'm really really excited for things to get back to normal and i hope i hope it's this thing doesn't really sort of put a big roadblock in all these careers that were just budding yeah well have you have you noticed like has well i'm not gonna say business has stayed the same but has there been what what's business been like i mean obviously when you're at a film fest you can talk to producers or executives or this or that and make handshakes and stuff like that has it become more of a phone call phone call zoom call zoom call to kind of pitch the film distribute the film and do you like the aspect that like do you think there will also there will always be a virtual aspect of film fest going forward or do you think it will kind of go back to okay we're doing this virtually now because we have no other option and then once things get back to normal it will kind of i don't want to be like a closed off kind of biosphere but uh-huh. for, for me personally i mean this is the fir- first like film festival i've been able to cover and it's yeah. been great because you know I get to talk to people like you. I get to interview people. Get to screen films that I would have probably had to have waited another year, two years, or maybe never to see the film. So uh-huh. you think there will always be, like obviously the, the the business has been changed dramatically. But do you think it will kind of go back to what it is, or do you think there will always be this aspect of a virtual experience for people who can't be on the ground all the time? I think that there will all there will always be in person screenings because yeah. I think that's just we're, we're just we're herd we're herd yeah. animals and we want to get together and we want to feel things. But I think that if you're going to be silver lining it, I think that these digital festivals have sort of opened our eyes to exactly what you're talking about, like giving access to people, not just people have to wait, you know, six months to stream. Mm-hmm. Uh, to watch something on streaming, but to be able to sort of maybe interact with the filmmakers, uh, read reviews, uh, sort of cover things and, and sort of see them without having to sort of leave their house. So I think, yes, I think there's always going to be a component. It's going to be interesting to see how that component works once people are, are able to go to theaters again. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would imagine that every festival that's able is going to now have sort of this, this part of it. I know it's not easy. I mean, I'm talking to some of the uh, other PR people that are putting on Fantasia this year. They're like, this is a nightmare. This is a yeah, <laughs> clusterfuck. This is this is what it is. Uh, and it, but it's a growing experience. I mean, it's it's for from everybody. Everybody who would have been in that theater watching the film, to you, to the producers, to the actors, to the people running Q and As, to mm-hmm. people being honored for an achievement award, to all the people running around 
screen to screen to screen to screen saying, I got a mm-hmm. meeting, got a, got a meeting, got a meeting. I mean, I guess in some ways it's a little bit, I don't, I don't know if you want to say it's good or bad, but you definitely have a little bit more of a, you're not being bothered by all the people you may not want to be bothered with all the time. So it's like, well, I can pick and choose this person, this person, this person, this person, and let's get on the call and hash this stuff out as opposed to being grabbed by your publicist or something like that. Like you're late for this meeting. Like, yeah. I'm not yeah. For any meeting right now. I, I mean, I've, I've never done it. See, this is my first, my first feature. So I've, mm. I've had very little experience being sort of pushed and pulled along through the, through the sort of press. So you, don't, you, don't, you don't even know what to miss at this point. So <laughs> I don't, I, I, all I know is that I miss the people. I miss the filmmakers and I miss even, even just the, weirdly enough, the staff who run the festivals, these people who like absolutely destroy themselves to like make these things happen are some of the most amazing people. And I always end up making friends at these different festivals when I go. And now it's just sort of an email or two. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's a person that I would probably be friends with that is like gonna probably drift out of my life or, mm. or, oh, that's a person that's like probably doing so much and I don't even know about it that's gonna drift out of my life. So it's, that's the part that kind of bums me out. I, I wanna like be able to, you know, say hello and buy this person a drink and just sort of like, I don't know, I guess human interaction, I guess we're all craving it at this point. We are. And this is, for a lot of people, this is as close as we kind of get. I mean, uh, in my profession, I'm out and about all day. I'm meeting people no matter what. So whether, whether for good, for, for better or worse, you know, I'm I'm out living in this, uh, I hate to say the most cliched term in the, in the history of like human existence right now is the new normal, which I absolutely (laughs) hate it. Um, and I can't wait for the uh, Netflix uh, docu series that comes out in 2021 for it. So yeah, <laughs> it's going to be fantastic. Um, Absolutely. Get Dan Harmon. Maybe Dan Harmon can do it. He, yeah, there you go. Make it there funny or something like that. You know, that goes back to something we were talking about off camera. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ron, um, great chatting with you. Uh, I enjoyed the hell out of uh, the Mortuary Collection for. Uh, your first feature, eight years in the making. I mean, it, it had the style, the gloss, the storytelling, the world building, the acting, everything that I would anticipate and love in an anthology. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, we're, we're sitting on a computer talking to each other about it as opposed to being in a theater, you know, laughing mm-hmm. about it afterwards or screaming or yelling or having a good time. <laughs> uh, you know, that that is disheartening, but the point is at least the, the film is getting out there. People are seeing right. it. I, eyeballs are going on it. I have nothing but positive stuff to say about it myself. Thank you, man. And, uh, Thank you so much. Thank um, you so much for the, for this interview. This is really fun. And I, I really appreciate the support and getting yep. the word out. Well, if is in closing, is there anything else you want to say kind of about, uh, about the film? I mean, we know, we all know it's uh, on demand at uh, Fantasia Fest and everything, but is there any, any parting words about the film? Uh, no, I think it's just I think it's it's a it's a movie uh, for people who love movies. It's a, it's a it's a celebration of stories and storytellers, um, which is sort of filmmakers. It's all of us. We're all storytellers, uh, and I think that there's um, it's for horror audiences, but I hope that uh, non horror audiences can appreciate it as well. I think there's a little bit of something for everybody. And uh, if you can't watch it at Fantasia, because I know so many people are geo-blocked and actually can't get access to it anyway, mm-hmm. I would say um, we're going to be on Shudder uh, October 15th as part of their big Halloween push. All right. Um, and if you don't have Shudder, you got to get it. It's awesome. I know I'm on it, so I'm biased, but I've been a <laughs> subscriber for way longer than I've been on Shudder. So uh, it, it's definitely a really cool thing, especially now if you're looking for sort of great uh, well curated horror it's the place to be absolutely and AM, amc backed and everything they kind of know what they're doing yep. i mean it's uh yep it, it, they, they just continue because i know uh, well congratulations to you getting on shutter getting distribution Thank on you. that so all, all of our north american friends i'm in i'm in nashville so technically i'm geo blocked from uh, watching the, the film as well but i have my ways and means so right right <laughs> i'm part of the press damn it i get what i want so. <laughs> but exactly. uh, congratulations on that i mean i know shutter just did like a big kind of bought up a, bought up a couple properties so to have you guys yep. part of that is pretty damn amazing and maybe one less thing to worry about for you right now at this point it's like yeah whew, at least it's streaming somewhere so it's out in the it's world it's exciting no i'm, I'm just ready for it to get out there <laughs> 
Well, people are going to be super, super stoked for it. All, all the North American audience and international audience will be stoked. All the Canadians who have already seen it up there, I'm sure they're yeah. that thing. So, <laughs> well, um, thanks again, Ryan. Really appreciate the time. Um, and I'm Matt. This was another episode of Simplistic Interviews. Um, if you have any comments, questions for me, email me, uh, matt at simplisticreviews.net or contact at simplisticreviews.net. We're all over the internet as well, too, every social media platform. Uh, do you have social media platforms, Ryan, that you want to throw out real quick? I do, I do. I'm on, I'm on the, the Twitters and the Instagrams. Oh, okay. What's your, what's your handles? That's, oh, that's, that's it's, the hard it's my name. It's, it's, it's my name. It's, it's, it's Ryan Spindell. Look up Ryan Spindell. You might get lucky and find him on <laughs> Instagram or Twitter because he's like, I don't really know. I'm on I'm, I'm on social media, <laughs> so it doesn't even matter at this point. But yes, check out the Mortuary Collection on Shutter October 15th in the countdown to Halloween. And if you haven't already, for any of uh, my Canadian friends listening to this right now, watch it on demand up there in the in the Great White North. You won't be uh, let down. So thanks everybody for listening, and we'll be back. Thank we'll you. Be